Hey everyone, welcome to lesson 5-4, The Compromise of 1850. Get myself up there. So by the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain the similarities and differences in how regional attitudes affected federal policy in the period after the Mexican-American War. So we're looking at, at how some areas agreed and some areas disagreed about what the United States chose to do after the Mexican-American War. So let's um, start off, first of all, and, and rewind a little bit in history back to 1820 and the Missouri Compromise. And if you remember, Missouri applied for admission to the Union as a slave state, which would have upset the perfect balance of free and slave states, northern and southern states in the Senate. So uh, Henry Clay worked out a compromise, whereas Missouri was a slave state, Maine entered as a free state. The balance was maintained. And then to prevent future fights, they drew a line along the southern border of Missouri that extended across the Louisiana Territory. And that Missouri Compromise line divided future territory above the line into free territory, which would become free states, and below the line into slave territory where slavery could legally be allowed. <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson warned us in 1820 that that was a firebell in the night. He said that that line on the map was going to do nothing but cause problems. And in 1850, Jefferson's prophecy proves true. Um, once the Mexican session was added, that southwest corner of the United States, um, immediately Congress began to debate the slavery issue, which had been first unboxed by David Wilmot and that Wilmot proviso during the Mexican-American War. Moderates in both parties said, you know what, the logical thing to do is just continue the line that was drawn across Louisiana territory all the way through the Mexican session. It's simple, it's fast, and it's logical. We'll just continue the line that we've been using. However, 30 years have passed and people aren't as willing to accept that compromise. Northern Whigs and Free Soilers want all of the new territory closed to slavery. Everything acquired by Mexico would legally, Congress would prohibit slavery in that territory. Southern Whigs and their Democratic allies want the whole territory open to slavery um, and that any of those states, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, um, would be open to slavery potentially. Um, the Democrats threw out an idea they called popular sovereignty as a solution to the problem. And under popular sovereignty, the residents of a territory, the people who live there, would be asked to vote whether that territory would be a free or slave state at the time that it petitioned Congress to join the Union. So popular sovereignty, the Democrats liked that because it took that debate, um, which was largely unanswerable in Congress, and it put it down to the people and said the people will make this decision and that will keep it out of Congress, which means we can worry about other matters and we will stop divide or driving that wedge between the northern and southern people in Congress. Um, it was Congress definitely pushing off their responsibility, but they said, who better to decide this issue than the people who are going to live in these communities? So that popular sovereignty idea was the Democrats liked it. The Northern Whigs wanted nothing to do with it. So with the end of the Mexican-American War, it became very clear that there was more and more resistance to slavery expanding into the West. So John Calhoun, one of the great leaders of the second generation of American leadership, called a convention in Nashville. And he called leaders from all the southern states to send delegates and address what should the South do about this looming problem that was going to happen in the Mexican session. And the, the, the committee actually debated secession from the United States. And secession is where the states would leave the Union and separate from the rest of the country. Um, Calhoun threw that idea out. They debated it. They talked about it. It kind of went back to the old days of nullification and Andrew Jackson, only a step further than South Carolina had taken it. 
When the convention adjourned, they stopped short of calling for a secession, but they also didn't take it off the table, which meant that it was still a possibility the South was going to leave out there. So with talk of secession and potentially a civil war in place, um, Congressman Henry Clay, again, from that second generation of leadership, that great compromiser, Henry Clay, worked with a, an emerging leader in the third generation, an Illinois senator named Stephen Douglas. Um, and together they negotiated a compromise. Clay was a, a, a Whig Party leader. Douglas was the unacknowledged leader of the Democratic Party, um, working together to say, OK, we have to calm things down just like we did in 1820. And so the Compromise of 1850 includes the following parts. One, California is admitted to the United States as a free state. No slavery. That was appealing to the North, especially because gold had been discovered in California by this time and its population was increasing. So California checked to the North. Arizona and New Mexico would be admitted to the Union once they became states under popular sovereignty. The voters in each of those territories would make the decision, um, which meant they could potentially go to slavery. That's a check on the side of the South. They felt like there was a pretty strong possibility one or both of those territories would vote to adopt slavery. Third is Washington, D.C., which was the nation's capital, had long been a, a hub of slave trading. It was actually auctioning of slaves um, occurred sometimes at the base of the steps of the U.S. Capitol. And congressmen felt that was not appropriate. So to the North's benefit, they prohibited the sale of slaves within the boundaries of Washington, D.C., um, and said, you cannot buy, sell, or auction slaves within the district. Now, that doesn't mean slaves weren't there. You could bring slaves in you purchased elsewhere, but the auctions would stop in the national capital. And finally, a strong fugitive slave act was passed, um, which allowed Southern slave owners to have more power in, in reclaiming lost property as they saw enslaved people who were fugitives are runaways. The Fugitive Slave Act of all the parts of the Compromise of the 1850 was the most controversial. It was the hardest one to get past. It was definitely a win for the South. That was the biggest thing they wanted in this compromise. Um, and it ignited yet another national firestorm. So let's take a look at the Fugitive Slave Act in depth a little bit more. Um, one thing is that there already were existing laws about fugitive slaves. Even the Constitution acknowledges that if there is an enslaved person who runs away, the owner has a legal right to reacquire that person because that's their property. Um, it doesn't make sense to the way we think of a people today, but it would be like if someone stole your car, you would expect to get your car back. That was how they looked at enslaved people. The problem was um, in northern courts, judges often refused to send fugitive slaves back to slavery in the south. So the laws were on the books, but they generally weren't enforced in the northern states. Some northern states prohibited people called slave catchers from even entering their communities. So the south felt like the law was being neglected and it was to their disadvantage. So the new federal law now gives much more power to Southern people who owned enslaved people. First, um, to identify someone as a fugitive was a pretty simple task. Remember, there's no driver's license, there's no photo ID. People didn't have pictures of slaves. Um, so what the, the law said is the owner's word or the word of their agent, someone they hire, was all it took to identify a fugitive. And usually those descriptions were pretty vague. They'd give a rough height, maybe weight, um, dark complected, light complected. What did their hair look like? Did they maybe have any scars? Um, but that was it. So pretty much if an owner said that person was my slave who is a fugitive, that's all that they had to do in court. 
The other thing is in court, um, black people were not allowed to testify. So a person accused of being a runaway slave could not utter a single thing in their defense. Um, they weren't allowed to say, no, I wasn't. You've got the wrong person. This wasn't me. Um, the only way they had a voice in court is if two other white people vouched for them. Um, and you can imagine at that time how difficult it would be to find two white people to testify in court on behalf of a black person who was accused of being a runaway slave. Third deals with judicial fairness, and this is where the law was really stacked in the favor of the South. Um, the law said when a judge hears the case about a fugitive slave um, and has to determine if the person in front of them is indeed the runaway slave, they have the power to do that. However, they will not get paid if they found that that individual is not the fugitive. Um, only if they, uh, they rule that the person in front of them is the fugitive, will they get paid for doing that judicial process. So obviously it's in judge's best interest to find a person is who the slave owner, or their agent identifies them as. Finally was a, a clause in the law that said, if, um, Agents who are pursuing fugitive slaves, in other words, people trying to reacquire um, lost or stolen property, are in pursuit of someone and they demand that people help them. Let's say the slaves running down the street or the accused person is running down the street. They were empowered to say, you stop that person. And if you did not assist them in enforcing the law as it was, then you as a, even as a bystander would be held liable and could face fines or jail time. Even if it went against your conscience and you in no way wanted to help recapture someone who had escaped slavery, if you did not help when instructed to do so, then you would bear a responsibility and could face punishment yourself. That citizen involvement clause was one that really, really frustrated Northerners who felt like their rights were being taken away, their right to choose. So the impact of the fugitive slave law is immense. Um, first, thousands or maybe even tens of thousands of slaves were now forcibly taken back into slavery. Let me rephrase that. Thousands of black people were taken back into slavery, many of whom had never been enslaved. They were free black people born and lived their entire life as free people um, in the North. And then the slave catchers come in and use poor identification, point to that person, and all of a sudden they'll find themselves in court and taken back down South and enslaved on a plantation. People that had no relationship whatsoever and, and were legally in essence kidnapped to the South. The other impact of the Fugitive Slave Act was laws that were passed in many northern states called personal liberty laws. And these personal liberty laws gave an individual the right um, to not help take away someone's liberty or freedom when asked to do so. So the law says if someone tells you you have to take actions that will take away someone else's liberty or freedom and you can opt out of doing that. In essence, that was addressing that citizen involvement clause of the Fugitive Slave Act. Uh, so if a slave catcher or a police officer in pursuit said stop that person, you could invoke the personal liberty laws. Now, here's the problem. The Fugitive Slave Act is a federal law. It's supposed to trump state laws that conflict with it. And the states knew that, but they were asserting states' rights as northern states, which is usually a southern thing, to have that law on the books. So these personal liberty laws were immensely irritating and frustrating for the South because they said, well, what's the point of the Fugitive Slave Act if the federal government is going to allow northern states to pass their own laws to simply get around it? So these personal liberty laws really increase that friction between northern and southern states.
So by now you should be able to explain the similarities and differences on how the different regional attitudes, Northern and Southern, affected federal policy in the period regarding the Mexican-American War. Um, and we'll see in 1850, those divergent attitudes once again forced a compromise like they did in 1820. But that compromise once again causes tension and friction. If you have questions, email or ask your teacher. And as always, have a great day.